So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us today. So this uh, panel for the next Einstein Forum Global Gathering 2020 is going to be on fostering innovative partnerships for African economic resilience and health crises, amid health crises. And so we really have a distinguished panel with us today. And so I'm Dr. I'm Eliani Baligero. I'm uh, the moderator of the panel, and it's an honor for me uh, to introduce um, our amazing panelists. So I'm going to have each one of them just uh, introduce themselves, just so that all of you out there know how lucky we are to be in such great presence. And we'll start with Diane. Diane, please. Thank you, Eliane. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me uh, on this uh, amazing panel. My name is Diane Karusisi. I'm the CEO of Bank of Kigali. It's a financial services group in Rwanda, the largest financial services in Rwanda. We have um, our group spans into commercial banking, investment banking, uh, insurance, and also technology. So I'm, I'm, I look forward to having a, an exciting conversation. Thank you, Diane. Isaac? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Isaac Rutenberg, and I am in Nairobi, Kenya. I am the director, sorry about that. I'm the director of the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law, which is a think tank and research center at Strathmore University uh, in Nairobi. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Pierre, Pierre, s'il vous plaît. Yes, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Pierre Sigre Traore. I'm the uh, Director of Research and Development at Manobi Africa, which is a private company working on orchestrating value creation in various sectors, agriculture, water distribution, etc. cetera. Um, and I originally come from the ag research sector. Um, I also am a scientist with the International Crop Research Institute for the semi-arid tropics, seconded to Manobi Africa. Thank you, Pierre. And our uh, last uh, panelist, Victor, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's also a pleasure to be with you in this uh, panel. Thank you for the organizers for inviting me. Uh, Victor Jimba from uh, UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, uh, the UN agency with the mandate to promote inclusive and sustainable industrial uh, development. Uh, I'm uh, 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 the head of the Africa division. That means we are in charge to uh, coordinate, uh, determine the strategy and ensuring that we meet the need uh, of uh, the member states. Uh, UNIDO operation in the continent is uh, more or less uh, half of uh, UNIDO uh, uh, of, uh, activities. So uh, nearly 50% uh, uh, of the uh, 54 uh, countries. Thank you very much. So thank you, Victor. And so just for all participants, I encourage you to uh, share any comments you have in the feed, as well as um, any questions you have for us in the Q&A. That way I can monitor this and uh, can incorporate it in our sessions today. So uh, just also, uh, I'm the Deputy Executive Director for Global Open Data and Agriculture and Nutrition. And so it's a real pleasure for me amid this 2020 uh, amazing uh, disruptive year that we have all gone through to ask our panelists the first questions. So what do you see are new partnership frameworks that are needed to support the recovery and build resilience of African economies during pandemics? If anyone of you wants to start, just please unmute yourself. I'm happy to start and contribute to that uh, question, if I may. Thank you. Please, please. So I, I think this, uh, this, this pandemic has, has shown us uh, globally that there's no statistics to um, the trust people have in their government, in their institutions. And we've seen uh, some countries have had uh, the resources, uh, the technology, etc., but the response was not um, that good uh, because uh, of the mistrust between, between the people and their governments. So I think going forward, uh, we need to look at every way of, of fostering a permanent dialogue between people, institutions, governments at all levels, uh, national, local governments, but also the private sector, 
because I think building that kind of governance is going to be uh, our best defense uh, going forward to prevent or uh, to respond to uh, pandemics. In particular, that uh, this pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, um, was um, the, re the response was relying on people's behaviors, uh, individual collective behavior. So you really need, need people to trust uh, institution uh, to abide by the rules uh, for this response to be effective. So I think going forward, uh, we are also looking at that at, at the level of, uh, of the company. How can we speak to our people and when we tell them uh, at work, of course, you know, you have to abide by the rules, but you don't want you to go uh, over the weekends and, uh, you know, meet people because there's a risk that you bring back uh, uh, the disease here. And it, it's really a constant dialogue that we have uh, to, to, we need to have with our people to convince them that they must have the right behaviors uh, because they would put, if they don't, then they put their lives at, at risk, but also uh, the lives of colleagues and family. So it's really important that we build uh, this right governance, this trust between our people, institutions, and leaders. And I believe this is going to be um, the best defense for us going forward. So this is my contribution, and I look forward to um, interacting on this. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Probably, if you allow me, I may, I may take a, I, I, I will take the floor now and look things from the perspective of uh, industrialization. Uh, we know we know that uh, the African uh, continent is one of the richest uh, continent in the world, but uh, the poorest and the less industrialized. People will ask uh, why. Uh, we know that uh, in uh, every uh, forum we have been attending. Uh, any uh, conferences that be discussing the issue, uh, the challenge, the opportunities. Uh, there's no uh, uh, disagreement on uh, uh, the challenges and also uh, the uh, solution to address uh, those uh, issues. Uh, we know that in the past uh, 60 years, industrialization has been uh, a, 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 a priority in the agenda of African uh, leaders, 60 years. So uh, why uh, so far uh, the performance in the industrialization and manufacturing are so uh, slow, despite the fact that uh, we have uh, many uh, uh, framework, we have the, the, the accelerated industrial development of Africa, we have the Agenda 2063, uh, we had uh, uh, the ADDA3, uh, even at the global level, uh, we have uh, initiative that, uh, uh, that aim to address uh, uh, to, to, to foster industrialization uh, in the uh, continent. And even the policy uh, uh, commitment is there. We see the African leaders, we see even with, with the AFCFTA, uh, the commitment to industrialize the continent. But why so far we have not uh, lived uh, to the expectation? I think one of the issues, I think, is the issue of, uh, of, of coordination. Because if you see uh, we have uh, the private sector uh, working alone on its side. We have the public sector on its own. We have the development partner providing the funding to the government and uh, leaving it alone. And then at the end, we found that the rate of implementation is low. The, uh, the government itself, its capacity uh, are, uh, are not so strong to be able to uh, optimally uh, uh, implement uh, those uh, resources. Uh, we see on the other side, the academia, uh, uh, that is supposed to bring uh, a, a solution uh, to the problem of the city, of the society, uh, they are working also alone. So I think the issue of uh, uh, coordination has more or less plumbed uh, uh, the development of, of uh, our continent. That's why uh, UNIDO is coming with uh, a new uh, approach, uh, what we call a, 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 a multi-stakeholder multi partnership approach. In fact, to be able to bring it together all the uh, capacities, all the resources of each of those partners, actors in the development, in the industrial, uh, in the industrial development scene, to really uh, combine, to maximize, to mutualize the resources so that we can maximize uh, the uh, impact. That is one. Now, when we consider the COVID uh, pandemic, we know that uh, uh, all the society, we are being hit hard in other aspects of our society is not only a health crisis, but it's also a socio-economic crisis. There are a lot of challenges, but also uh, opportunities. Now we have to see with not only the supply chain has uh, are disrupted, 
that we have a demand shock where the the the, the uh, due to the uh, uh, due to the uh, 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 the confinement, the lockdown, uh, 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 people cannot go to work, the enterprise cannot uh, uh, optimally uh, produce. We are called to uh, in, 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 uh, innovate. Even the investment, uh, the, the uh, FDI we were expecting in the continent, uh, we, we, we are experiencing a, 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 a drastic reduction, more than 60% of the FDI in the continent. With the disruption of the supply chain continent uh, 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 the global supply chain we are we are we are we are we are condemned I, I will say we have to see how else we can move forward that's why we i think we have to innovate not only that we have to uh, 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 strengthen uh, 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 the partnership we have to work uh, uh, together but at the same time we have to see how we can bring innovative uh, solution to all those uh, issues. Uh, 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 we see how uh, without uh, the uh, ICT, without the digital uh, uh, technologies, it would have been very complicated to be able uh, to, uh, 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 to, 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 to undertake these activities, uh, uh, whether uh, 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 be the government or, 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 or in the economy, we, we see how uh, 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 the importance of uh, uh, digitalization has been uh, 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 very much. So I will say we need to strengthen the part. We have the partnership. We have to uh, in a, in a, in a innovate. We also have to consider how to uh, foster digital uh, transformation uh, in the continent. I will stop here. Thank you, Victor. So Pierre or Isaac, sure, can, oh, go ahead, Isaac. Sure, uh, I'll just bring up two points that support um, what, uh, my main point. And the first one is that uh, uh, the informal sector is the most important aspect of the economy in, in many African countries, and Kenya is included. Uh, the vast majority of, of people actually are employed by the informal sector. And, and the second point is that um, if you are uh, trying to make it in the informal sector, access to capital is still extremely important and sometimes the defining aspect of whether you can make it or not. But unfortunately, in the informal sector, a lot of banks, formal banks won't, um, won't work with you. So those two, two facts uh, have led to a very interesting situation where, uh, at least in Kenya, where um, mobile uh, loan app apps, these uh, Tala and other uh, well-known apps, are the most popular apps that people um, download and they use them uh, to an incredible degree. Uh, unfortunately, those apps also tend to have um, a lot of drawbacks, including predatory lending rates and very questionable uh, uh, practices in terms of data protection and other things like that. So I think, I think the specific question of how, what sort of new partnership frameworks has been answered in the sense that the need of, of access to capital has led to these loan app, apps that work with people to, to be able to, to just access small amounts of capital to keep going and, and continue their, their business. Um, but it's, it's very clear that the, that the current way that those, that those partnerships are working is um, not ideal. And so I would say uh, some tweaking on that probably through law and regulation uh, would, would really um, go a, do a great deal of, of, of benefit for uh, supporting uh, people as they're trying to recover and, and build their, their, um, their business activities. Thank you. Isaac, that was really informative. Pierre, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eliane. Um, really, um, I don't have much more to say because they said it all um, other than when I look at the question, I'd like to reframe it a little bit and say that um, it focuses a lot on the recovery during the pandemics and uh, even the question three we have on the response, I think are um, a little bit restrictive in the sense that they frame uh, the partnership frameworks in a, in a bit of a reactive or, or, or tactical uh, perspective. And I think uh, one critical aspect, and I look at it really from the perspective of uh, agricultural production, is that 
uh, we need to have uh, partnership frameworks that are more uh, strategic, that are more holistic, and that are more anticipatory in their uh, capacity uh, to understand that uh, COVID is a pandemic, but it's only one of several types of global shocks that could have effect on uh, African economies. And the most um, interesting of them, in, in fact, I'd say in some ways, COVID is a blessing in disguise uh, because it had the merit of revealing for Africa the enormous dependency that some countries in particular have on food imports. And as you, as you well know, uh, some countries like uh, Russia or Vietnam or the Philippines have restricted, have imposed constraints on food exports, uh, which are going to affect Africa uh, sooner or later, and uh, highlight the fact that if we think of it uh, in terms of uh, basic food security, we have to perhaps uh, come to the realization today that food sovereignty should be a precursor to food security. We cannot, we live in a very strange world today, and this has been really well revealed by COVID and alluded to by uh, the other um, colleagues, that today it is extremely uh, easy for a bank in Africa to lend money to an importer, uh, but it is nearly impossible for a smallholder to access credit. Um, you, at the same time, if you look at it, it would take only a portion of the amount of money that Africa spends on food imports to actually uh, structure um, and achieve food sovereignty. So make sure that the local value chains are able to uh, deliver the, the level of performance uh, productivity um, and efficiency that uh, that would be expected. So I think for this really first question, one of the key aspects, in addition to what has been said, is to have a better understanding of who is supposed to play what role. Uh, there is often a bit of a confusion uh, that, uh, for example, uh, the public sector uh, is there, for example, to develop digital infrastructures. Uh, not necessarily. They're not the most agile of them. Um, and you could uh, you could argue that delivery platforms are better placed in the in the private sector, and we see it in uh, in, in in Kenya, for example, with M-Pesa and other um, digital finance uh, mechanisms. On the other hand, it's not really the role of the private sector to develop uh, and implement policies that protect um, the development of your. And uh, if we look at uh, the situation that I alluded to regarding the food imports you do need some level of protection, like perhaps what uh, happened in Nigeria last year uh, when uh, President Buhari said, I will not allow Forex to be released to uh, by Central Bank of Nigeria for the import of specific commodities. Because if you don't have that level of protection, you can do a brilliant job in digitalizing the, the national value chains and improving their efficiency, but they are just not going to cut it alone. So, we need a more holistic approach, a more uh, a stronger capacity for foresight, and we absolutely need to bridge this kind of uh, mutual defiance that there is between the public and the private sector uh, to work together. So, Pierre, ju just to fo a quick follow up, um, for many people, the difference between food security and food sovereignty may not be clear. Could you just uh, just add a little bit of more information just to, to help people distinguish the two and why sovereignty should come first? Well, um, food security does not um, discern where the food comes from. You could be food secure just because you have the capacity to purchase your food elsewhere on the international markets. Uh, food sovereignty supposes that you're uh, capable of producing yourself the food that you require. Um, and you have a lot of variation across African countries in that respect, but the general picture is that we are dependent on imports at a very high level. And uh, we, actually I would, I would state uh, that we waste a lot of money importing food. Thank you, Pierre. I think uh, from, from the uh, African Development Bank data, I think the, the, the projections are by 2025, Africa could be importing $110 billion worth of food. And so, so that's a huge opportunity. And in this context of how do we bounce back in terms of resilience, how can uh, this agenda in terms of 
uh, how can these partnerships that need to be put in place, whether it's on the policy side, whether it's on the competitive market side, how can we support building uh, resilience that really benefits vulnerable groups and especially women? Thank you. Let, let me uh, start as um, the only woman uh, amongst the panelists, Elian. Uh, yeah, when, when it comes to vulnerable groups, I think uh, solidarity, be it national or international, is, is quite critical. Uh, in, in periods like such as this, uh, in, in crisis periods, you, you need this solidarity uh, for these vulnerable groups to have access to, you know, basic uh, food or ba access to basic services. So, so solidarity, I think, is quite important. But uh, looking at the example of Rwanda, uh, uh, community-based groups like the cooperative move movement in Rwanda, I think we, we don't say it enough, but the cooperative movement, movement in Rwanda has been probably one of the most um, important solutions for fighting uh, poverty. Uh, you have these women uh, coming together in cooperatives, in rural areas, in urban centers, and as uh, Dr. Isaac was saying, you know, many of many people uh, uh, work in the informal sector and they rely on you know, daily jobs uh, to put food on their tables. So these people coming together, uh, I think, is the best way to get uh, services um, channeled to them. It can be governments, it can be NGOs, it can be even private sector organizations. I think even for us as a bank, it's uh, safer for us to provide access to finance, to a cooperative that is well organized. Uh, than uh, doing small loans to the individual uh, uh, farmer or trader. So, so this is something that is uh, very important and uh, it has helped uh, in Rwanda a lot. Now, building resilience, I think, again, uh, there's no way you can build resilience as an individual. Uh, it's important to build resilience as a community. And I think uh, these uh, community-based organizations um, can help do that. Another thing I want to say is... Uh, not only in Africa, but even in, in uh, elsewhere in, in the world. Sometimes uh, a small health, sh health shock in, in a family, uh, main, mainly when this is affecting the breadwinner of the family, is you know, the, the next step between uh, a family that is having, is, is striving, to falling uh, in, in poverty immediately. Uh, that's why uh, we're talking about partnerships. I think uh, any partnership that we can think of that will result in uh, universal health coverage is going to be extremely important to build resilience because you know you, you can have everything you can start build a small business but you know you are not immune from uh, you know this pandemic from any sickness and if this is the the, the one thing that can uh, uh, take you back to poverty i think it's something that we need to tackle as as, as a group as communities and as countries so, so this is quite important. At the bank uh, here, for, for instance, we finance um, or we, we support communities that come together to uh, pay their uh, universal health coverage. We call it mutuelle de santé here. And we believe, I think, we need to work more towards these kind of solutions to get people to have uh, all these people uh, with uh, health insurance that will uh, probably help them in a crisis period like that. And, uh, and uh, make sure they, that these communities are resilient. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. I just want to follow up quickly one of the things you said. You talked about solidarity. And last week, uh, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, said solidarity is humanity and solidarity is survival. And, and he, he also went on saying we cannot go back to the old normal, normal of inequality, injustice, and headless dominion over the earth. Instead, we must step towards a safer, more sustainable and equitable path. And so I just wanted to highlight, you know, your, the issue of solidarity and how important that is. Um, so, Victor, I see you. you yeah, okay, yes. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's a good uh, question in the continuity of the first one. I will, I will, I will, uh, I will point uh, two aspects. Uh, resilience, I think, uh, involves First of all, uh, production, and uh, second, uh, uh, inclusiveness. I think uh, 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 earlier you mentioned that we 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 import nearly uh, 40 billion of food every year, and uh, you said that uh, the estimate from the African Women Bank 
probably the next five to ten years will be exporting nearly uh, 110 billion of food if nothing is done is the equivalent of the deficit what we need in terms of uh, infrastructure all considering transport telecommunication etc uh, that is one thing and the second thing uh, we do not meet in fact our need we, we are, our level of production is very low so there's a huge opportunity if we only consider uh, uh, our regional uh, sourcing nearly 20 uh, 21 50% of uh, 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 of our uh, uh, intra african trade so there's a huge uh, uh, opportunity to increase our production but when we increase in our effort to increase this uh, production we need to do it in an inclusive uh, manner another aspect i will bring in to see the linkages is that when we see the population of our production capabilities more than 90 percent of uh, the firms enterprises the 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 the, the micro the macro small and medium enterprises uh, uh, more or less 90 percent of them constitute the population of our productive uh, capacities in, in them we have the women we have the young even the former and informal sector if we try to produce more, but in an inclusive, ma in an inclusive uh, man a man a manner, I think it will contribute to to address the issue of resilience and inclusiveness. We have to uh, build leakages, leakages between uh, the big firms and the small firms and the micro. Everyone has a role to play. In fact, this idea of a partnership, in fact, is working uh, together. Each one bringing his own capacity we have to build the skill at all the level because we have to uh, uh, maximize our pro our production i think uh, in the north shell we have to develop clusters among other between the big firms and the medium the small and medium and also the macro uh, the macro uh, enterprises we have to we have a, a big formal and sector uh, informal sector uh, in the continent is a source of huge employment. We have to see a way to uh, uh, structure them, to, to, to develop their skill and to involve them, to include them, to bring them in the supply chain of all the uh, production uh, capacities. I think is very much uh, uh, important if we want to address uh, this uh, 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 issue of uh, resilience in, uh, uh, in a sustainable way. And again, uh, uh, I will uh, highlight the aspect of uh, 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 innovation systems. We have to uh, we have to work uh, together, not work together only, but we have to work uh, uh, together from the design to the implementation. When we design solution, we have to work uh, together. All the stakeholders uh, they have to design uh, together so that each one know at which stage what he has to do. We usually talk about the business environment. If we have a business environment and we do not have the productive capacity, so we need to, to bring the private sector and the public sector. We need to bring the academia. We need to bring the development partners. We need to bring the civil society in order to really address so that nobody is left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, I'll go next again. Uh, I think uh, what Dr. Karusisi said was extremely important uh, about shocks to the to the family, and I, I want to um, I want to talk about two two things real quickly. One is um, we I think we need to recognize when policies or uh, activities ad, uh, specifically affect women uh, disproportionately. For for example. Uh, I know in several countries, including Kenya, we, uh, we've been closing markets, uh, open air uh, food markets, and handing out f lots of food because uh, for the very real reason that, uh, you know, having those markets uh, increases the spread of, the, of COVID and, and also um, people are still hungry. So you need food. But the problem with that is that uh, those markets disproportionately provide income to women. So when you close down a market, you have now um, taken away the livelihood of a lot of people. So it's great that 
we're providing people with food and that they're not starving, but it's terrible now that those a lot of women have just lost their source of income. So uh, I think recognizing that fact and 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 designing policies to or uh, approaches to uh, to assist those people who have lost uh, the income uh, can help a lot. The, the second thing I'll, I'll mention is, um, and this is not specific to, to pandemics, but is always the case, um, women need safe workplaces. And, and in a lot of cases, that's just simply not what they have. And so um, for whatever reason, um, patriarchal, patriarchal societies um, lacks enforcement of laws, um, whatever it may be, um, I know very well that uh, many women don't feel safe in, in, in the workplace. And so, um, you know, th those sorts of things need to be recognized and they need to be uh, addressed through through policy and through through uh, effective implementation of, of oftentimes what are, you know, laws that are on that are on the books, but just simply not enforced. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. That is very helpful. Pierre, please. Well, thanks very much, Eliane. Um, I'd like to also uh, be provocative again and say, well, when you see this question, you um, want to take it for granted that youth and women are the vulnerable groups. Uh, well, uh, anecdotally, you would want to say that at the health level, epidemiologically, they are not. <laughs> but uh, we also know that, obviously, in Africa, we have very uh, heterogeneous levels of uh, empowerment of uh, of vulnerability, and it's important not to just cut and paste the maybe the Western discourse and understand how is vulnerability actually structured and framed in Africa. Um, one way we look at it a lot is um, smallholders versus the others. Uh, obviously, smallholders involve a lot of uh, youth and women, uh, so that is uh, that is one uh, one aspect. Another one is. Uh, the urbans versus the rurals, because they have uh, different types of exposure profiles to uh, the economic impact of um, of COVID or similar shocks. One of the um, ideas that I like to often promote is to say, well, uh, they might be vulnerable, but they are also very industrious and very innovative. Uh, if we focus, for example, more of the financing or interventions on the post-harvest um, section of agriculture, you will find that many women are actually involved in the post-harvest cycle, uh, whereas the production, the pre-harvest, is mostly uh, involving men. So uh, tailoring a dedicated investment towards those uh, sections of the, the chain is likely to affect women uh, positively. Uh, you have multiple examples in Africa of women uh, usually performing or outperforming men in uh, several aspects of trade and business. Uh, the commodity queens in Ghana are very well known and they really uh, own pretty much the markets. Uh, you find it at uh, various level, the Mami Benz and whatever in Togo, uh, who are doing the same thing across other sectors. Uh, so these, um, these are, I would say, reservoirs of, of knowledge that actually belong to women that can be leveraged because they have a lot of uh, capacity uh, in terms of managing uh, income and, uh, and, and, and handling resilience. Uh, for the youth, I think that is really a very important question for Africa because we're going to double the population in the coming two decades and we are generating uh, an enor enormous uh, mass of youth. Uh, and unfortunately, in many countries, uh, the uh, cur academic curricula have not adjusted to this enormous uh, influx of, of new graduates. Uh, so I think that the, the kinds of initiatives that we see, for example, at AIMS with the uh, words integrated learning, uh, these types of uh, linkages where you, you, you favor apprenticeship, what, what, they call, what they would call in French traditionally compagnonage, um, are really important to um, create a segue between the time you study and the time you start work because I don't know for example in Mali uh, the time between your your diploma and your first job is typically seven years it is unacceptable we have to bridge that gap and there may be several ways to actually invest uh, to to create those um, those, uh, those 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 bridges but again um, talking again about the identification of who is vulnerable and who is, isn't, 
um, you need to look at a variety of, uh, of dimensions and not only women and youth. Uh, we, we see it in the agricultural value chains very strongly uh, where you could have, for example, farmers that are organized informally into farmer groups at a village level. It's much more easier to work with them than with uh, structured umbrella organizations or federations because these um, institutions have power structures in place that are detrimental to their own members more often than the smaller groups. Um, so um, I will expand maybe on this as part of the next questions. Thank you. Actually, that's a, a really great segue to the next question, uh, which is what is the role that development agencies can play in supporting African governments to promote innovation to better respond to pandemics? Thanks, Elian. Um, if I may start again. Um, yes, development partners that bring financial resources, which are you know, obviously critical. Uh, but, but beyond that, they, they bring um, knowledge, they bring uh, information that, that probably um, African countries don't, uh, or African governments don't have uh, immediately uh, for them to organize the, their response. I mean, the, the easiest, uh, we, we can look at what um, WHO has done. Uh, in the past uh, year or so, I think, you know, everyone, every government has relied on information and advice given by um, uh, the World Health Organization to organize their own response. And I think, you know, ev every one of us was looking at uh, what uh, Dr. Tedros would say uh, to see how it would uh, uh, behave. So it, it's quite um, important. And in this very interconnected world, world where, you know, a pandemic that, um, started in China and spread in you know, weeks uh, all over the world, I think information sharing is also extremely important. And uh, today, in, the, in today's wor world, which is, you know, as I was saying, uh, interconnected, we also have so many sources of information. It is the era of uh, fake news, etc. cetera. So, so we need to have a reliable source of information coordinated, uh, you know, for, for people to have, you know, uh, some info, some real information to, to take action on. So I think these uh, international organizations can support that, coordinating, uh, putting together the information, supporting Af African governments with this knowledge and this information, in addition, obviously, to, to um, um, financial resources. I'm hoping now that uh, the vaccine has been found, uh, I'm hoping that these uh, international organization development agencies will support African uh, governments get access to this vaccine and, and, and uh, get uh, you know, many African pe people, in particular the most vulnerable, uh, vaccinated uh, very quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. That's a really great point around misinformation. What we know is that there's six times more misinformation on, on the web than, than actual facts. So this is critical. How do we ensure uh, the validity of what we read? So Victor, what would you like to add, please? Okay, I think it is an interesting uh, question. Uh, the role of the development partners, I think, uh, the development partners, first of all, we have to uh, be, uh, to make it clear, uh, the, uh, the responsibility, the primary responsibility for development is, uh, is, uh, is the one of the government. Yeah, so the development uh, partners, they come to support. So we have to uh, understand that. That means when uh, there are issues, their problem to be solved. I think uh, uh, coming to support that means the initiative that are being taken, their the 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 policy, their action on the ground, and then we come to support a development partner. If a development partner come and there's nothing there, nothing can be done. So first of all, but uh, 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 based on what I see in the in the uh, uh, the coordinated response, the African country uh, 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 provided. Uh, uh, to uh, in front to address the uh, COVID-19 the uh, pandemic is very uh, commendable. Uh, having said that, the uh, uh, partner in terms of cooperation, as uh, I said uh, uh, the previous uh, speak, uh, speaker, is a source of uh, uh, best practices, a source of experience and expertise, the capacity to uh, convey uh, 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 many partners and then to address uh, an issue in the different angles uh, holistically. They can play a neutral role in coordinating. We are talking about the partnership 
think uh, having a neutral uh, uh, a broker is very important. And the development partner can really play uh, that role, building a trust among the different uh, stakeholders. I think uh, it's key, the source of great uh, knowledge because it's a platform, the experience in the longer per period, so they can, they, 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 they can come to really, they can bring that, that wealth of uh, expertise and experience uh, in addressing uh, uh, issue in a in an in an in an in an innovative uh, manner and uh, also we are in a we are in a globalized world so i think uh, uh, no country or no continent uh, could work uh, 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 on its own so we are called to uh, interact we all have uh, 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 strengths and weaknesses and then we are called to support uh, each other I think uh, they have a key, a, an, an important role, but the primary role to, to really uh, provide responses uh, uh, rest first of all with uh, the government and the different national uh, stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Uh, yeah, I, I, I love this question. I want to uh, address not what development agency, agencies should be doing in Africa, but what they should be doing back where they originate. Uh, and so in particular, I want to say that developing agencies uh, need to stop perpetuating negative stereotypes about Africa. And I'll just point out one example, uh, you know, at the very beginning of the COVID um, outbreak in about March or April, a very prominent person in a very large American uh, development agency came on TV and saying Africans are going to be dying in the streets. It's going to be absolutely terrible. And I'm sure you, you know what I'm talking about. And it turns out, you know, 11, 10 months later, that was absolutely not the case. And, uh, and, and America has quite a lot of problems that they need to be fixing on their own and they don't need to be perpetuating those sorts of stereotypes. So very, very simple. I like uh, that's a, a really good point, and I think that comes to the point that how astonished the world has been of, uh, in terms of Africans' uh, response to the pandemic and Africans' beliefs in in facts and and uh, the preparedness from previous uh, epidemics that actually Africans felt okay, we're going to wear masks because it's important, and and also in terms of worldviews of the importance of community. How do we support and protect each other? And so I think you, you make really good points. And uh, you know, Diane earlier talked about the issue of trust. And I think uh, Rwanda has been toted as one of the examples of where things have gone really well. And I think this issue of how do we ensure trust happens has been critical. But also, I think people underestimate how much Africans believe in science. And, and really believe in fact-based decision-making. So just uh, want to reinforce that. So Pierre, please. Yeah, Thank, thanks, uh, Eliane. Well, I love uh, the fact that uh, uh, my predecessor loves the question because I love his answer. <laughs> and I want to add to this that, uh, you know, I, I look at this, uh, this question from a kind of um, a three-pronged uh, stance. Taking, I, I love analogies. In fact, uh, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not good at uh, modeling or predicting the future. But I look at, uh, for example, what uh, is recommended in terms of uh, management of the epidemic. So they they used to say you need to test a lot, and then you need to protect with masks, and then you need the the vaccine eventually to sort out the question. If I take this model and I transpose it to uh, African agriculture, because that's really the domain I come from. Um, it brings me to the three really uh, key issues that these development agencies should focus on. The first one is that um, uh, we cannot afford to have a fragmented approach. This is a complex system. You don't answer it with uh, turnkey solutions. There's no magic in this. It takes uh, a good deal of knowledge, uh, contextual knowledge, understanding, and, and scientific knowledge, of course, to address and the the analogy that we use is that to us the uh, for example the vaccine of course is important in the end but it relates to the capacity of governments to build uh, the uh, the infrastructure 
um, which is really the prerogative of the state, making sure that you have roads, that you have decent education systems, that you have good health systems, that you have security. It's essentially building the, the, the basic immunity of your agricultural system and nobody can do it apart from the state. So recognizing the role that they have to, uh, to do to protect the capacity of the states to invest just uh, the same way we want to do it with a vaccine. Then the, the mask is really, again, this policy. You have to create the enabling environment that allows you, when needed, to protect your national economy. We are capable of producing um, sufficient food to feed ourselves. We are actually able to produce more and export it elsewhere. But without the appropriate uh, protection and uh, protection against the perverse incentives that we see in the system uh, with all kinds of, you know, middlemen or information asymmetries that allow people to thrive on uh, the benefits of food imports, for example, then uh, it is not going to happen. And then the last one is about the testing. The same thing that happened with the health issue is the scarcity of data. Well, Africa still is a data desert. Let's admit it and accept it. Uh, but for that data to really become um, actionable information, it has to be collected in context. And you need to have a lot of uh, intelligence and knowledge of the local context to qualify that data to make it trustworthy and not uh, uh, you know, uh, a contribution to a fake news, uh, maybe distributed by a fly-by-night operator coming from very far away and who could tell you, well, I can predict your yields at the end of this season based on this and that uh, data source. This needs to, to really be improved. So I think the role of the development agencies is to help uh, the governments and other partners uh, coordinate those efforts and understand that a fragmented approach is not going to make it. It has to be coordinated. It has to involve uh, governments, the public sector, uh, the private sector, and and other um, agencies. So, uh, in a way, that's a good segue to our last question, which is, what is the support should we provide to African startups to ensure their business continuity in the new normal? And I'll just add, more than business continuity, it's how do we innovate and disrupt so that we have food sovereignty and security, and that we have the needed um, innovation happening on the continent to really help the economic resilience uh, amid health crisis. So uh, we have about 12 minutes left for the session. So um, please, I, I look forward to your responses. Thank you, uh, Elan. Yes, go ahead, yeah. For, for this last question, um, I think that this crisis has exposed so many gaps uh, in the value chains that uh, I think entrepreneurs and uh, innovators have now plenty of ideas of where uh, and how they can close these gaps uh, to support resilience uh, in the economy, but also to, to be able to serve uh, the needs uh, in the market. So uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic and uh, I think that you know, I'll see many um, business people coming our way looking for financing uh, to, to, you know, to build new businesses that will thrive um, uh, post-COVID. And, and I think as, 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 as uh, you know, uh, banks, uh, companies, as companies in the financial sector, we need to be you know, ready to find the right uh, financing package, uh, packages for these um, entrepreneurs. But we also need, I think th this time has been uh, quite difficult uh, when you're on, on, you know, at the helm of a large company with uh, you know, all the structures, all the policies in place. Uh, it, it's you know, not as difficult as it is for small companies to navigate uh, through uh, difficult periods. So, so what we should also do um, in the private sector is to, to mentor these uh, entrepreneurs and to tell them, you know, we, we have this set of policies that have worked for us. This is how we're implementing the, the remote uh, work policy. You know, maybe you can uh, learn a thing or two from what you're doing. And I think this men mentorship, this uh, coaching of, of these uh, 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 startups is, is going to help a lot. Now, in addition to that, as a bank, what we've done is uh, to provide some relief uh, for, for these companies that were not uh, um, you know, getting any revenues because of the situation. We've provided some relief. In Rwanda, the government set up uh, what they call uh, the Economic Recovery Fund to refinance uh, some of these loans at a lower rate uh, 
uh, to make sure you know when uh, the economy recovers and uh, you know business is back to normal, uh, these people will have uh, you know the, the debts in the financial sector will not have ballooned too much, and they will still be in a position to um, uh, make the, the payments. So I think that, that that's what we can do. That's what I can offer. Uh, but I look forward to hear uh, from others. Thank you. Please go ahead, Victor. Victor? Okay, okay. I, I was just uh, waiting uh, no, the right no, to the floor. Okay, I think I think the startup is a uh, they have a key hole in the in the society, uh, particularly with the opportunities now we have, uh, not only uh, with uh, the start of the trading under the AFTFT that we that will uh, begin the opportunity to uh, develop the regional uh, value chain and also the COVID uh, situation that uh, that has uh, revealed the uh, the uh, creativity uh, potential of uh, uh, young uh, uh, Africans. I think uh, uh, we know that we saw already in terms of uh, 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 Africa has the youngest, the, the, the highest young population entrepreneurial population in the world. So I think, but uh, they cannot uh, really uh, uh, prosper without a conducive uh, environment, uh, an ecosystem that really address their need, uh, particularly in terms of the type of innovative financing in the need, I think uh, venture capital, etc. Uh, they also need, uh, the young people, they have this entrepreneurial drive, so, but we need to have the, uh, fa the uh, financing, very particular type of uh, financing is very important. We need uh, uh, non-financial also uh, capabilities. We need the uh, platform for the sharing of experiences, uh, etc. They also need to be integrated in the production system. I think uh, uh, all this has to be provided in an integrated way. Uh, we at uh, UNIDO, uh, recently we are supporting uh, even the regional communi communities uh, to uh, 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 develop this type of uh, new ent enterprises. Uh, recently we supported uh, the organization of the first uh, forum uh, uh, on the startup in West uh, Africa. We know that there, there are a lot of uh, issues to be addressed, but they can be addressed. Uh, the environment, the opportunities uh, are there. There, we just need to take the right uh, uh, policy, uh, uh, the right incentives, and also to really integrate uh, uh, this type of enterprises in the production uh, system. Uh, entrepreneurial, uh, the domain of the entrepreneurship is very also uh, uh, important. But we have to understand that. Uh, 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 the solution to our problem will come from Africa first. And uh, our young population, more than 60 uh, percent of the uh, population in uh, Africa is young, and uh, we, with a uh, high capacity to uh, create, to uh, innovate. I think there's a lot of uh, effort to be done, but we need to really address uh, to fill the different gaps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Uh, Isaac? Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll answer this tw two ways. <clears throat> First of all, I've, I've worked with hundreds of startups, literally, uh, in, in, in our university. And um, there's uh, two things I think can be done. One is impossible. The other one is, is not at all impossible. The, the, the impossible one is that um, a startup is the most difficult job in, in the world, I'm convinced. It is absolutely it is so difficult to to build something out of nothing, create your own market, convince people to pay you uh, when you have no track record whatsoever. It is incredibly difficult. And the failure rate is very high. Everywhere in the world, it is extremely high for startups. But um, but particularly in, 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 in Africa, I think in, at least in Kenya and probably most parts of Africa, the, the stigma against failure is very strong. Uh, People are, are, are not really willing to take a risk um, if there's a very high chance of, of failure, which in startups there is. But um, I mean, one of the problem, one of the reasons for that stigma is, is 
is certainly cultural, but the, another reason is that there's very little in terms of a, of a safety net for, for people who do fail. So, um, and then the, the, the thing that isn't really impossible is, is, is tax law. Uh, a lot of the startups in, in Kenya here are, are based on uh, online activities. And, um, you know, anytime something starts to make money, the government uh, sees a way of taxing and increasing revenue, which I, I understand they need to, to increase revenue, but um, it, it's very easy to um, sort of kill the, go the, the goose uh, when you're when you do that, and um, and they've you know they've they've been trying to, and, and many countries have succeeded in introducing online tax laws, and um, you know those those really those really uh, I think they shoot the government in the foot when uh, when they make it more difficult for for companies to uh, you know young companies um, through through tax um, disincentives to to be operating in that way. Thank you, Isaac. So, Pierre, can you close us off the last three minutes? Absolutely. Thank you, Eliane. Um, I think, um, well, first of all, as I like to criticize questions, I'd like to say that the focus on startups is, a, is, a, is essential, but we must not forget that between the startups and maybe the big multinationals, there's a big, wide gap. And if we want Africa to be more um, competitive, and achieve those kinds of productive goals, we have to think of all that's in between. And that's the what I would typically call the SMEs, um, which are companies that are already established that have not really reached the capacity to uh, to compete on uh, on, on a, a wide range of, um, of markets, but need support. I think we need to densify um, the tissue and the performance of this SME fabric if you will, in, in Africa, because they're the ones that really are providing the glue uh, to do all the heavy lifting in terms of, of development outcomes. So you, you cannot rely on a system where you have leading global operators, and I won't name them because there are many in many uh, sectors of the economy, that actually come to Africa because we're producing a lot of brains and plunder the brain uh, for their own benefit. You have to make sure that there is some a kind of regulatory mechanism to allow the SMEs to actually also make use of um, um, the um, innovation that is coming um, in Africa and make it used by the African private sector. And in, the, in that particular sense, what um, my predecessor said is, is really important. Risk aversion is uh, common to all humans. Uh, farmers are risk averse. Um, and it's a problem, but uh, bankers are also very risk averse. The problem is that a banker being risk averse has implication for m hundreds of thousands of individuals. The farmer being risk averse uh, involves only him or herself and his family, right? So if we want to help uh, the SMEs and the African private sector, we also have to find ways to de-risk uh, the uh, investment by the banks and uh, we believe that one of the essential points today is to build uh, some kinds of guarantee funds. Uh, and you have plenty of options and experiences that are starting to emerge with pension funds and others to allow banks to actually invest in, in the African private sector, which they don't really do uh, to the satisfactory level today. So um, if you're interested, I can post some references to another webinar we organized on that particular uh, issue, um, and I will put them in the chat line. Thank you. Please, that would be great. Thank you, Pierre, for putting the link uh, in the chat box. So for all of you, please make sure you, um, anybody who's interested in it, uh, uh, clicks on it so that you can have it. But I think the chat box will be available for at least another 15 minutes. So just want to thank everybody, all the participants, uh, all the uh, the questions. I, I've tried to, there were very particular questions, so I've tried to just guide uh, responses to that. And I really thank all the panelists. This was a, a really thought-provoking discussion. Uh, I really loved the changing of the, the questions themselves and questioning, are we asking ourselves the right questions? I think that was great. At the end, I really think the concept you brought in of solidarity is one that we really need to keep in mind. And I really appreciated all the participants' uh, 
ways of, of helping us open our minds. How do we move away from risk aversions and fail forward and disrupt so that we can actually meet the great needs that are uh, for economic resilience and health crisis management to happen in ways that are going to help us to help Africa thrive and meet the sustainable development goals.